Hi, everybody. We have a money energy babe, a teacher, a professor on the show today. Her name's Amber Duggar, and she does a great job of combining the financial expertise with the energy of money and helps us create a life of joy and use money as the vehicle to get there. I have a bazillion questions for her. I wanted to have her on the show today because I want I want to try and get out of our three easy steps that we all can do to enhance our relationship with money. And I have lots of other questions for her about the energy of the banks and the financial institutions and how we can navigate that by creating abundance and and joy and whatever that are all the goodies that come when we have money. So stay with us. It's gonna be interesting to see what her answers are to these questions. Remember to subscribe, remember to like and comment, and remember to share this with your family and friends. Let's go see what we can learn from Amber. Hi, Amber. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Julie. I'm so honored to be here. Oh my gosh. I Amber and I had a private session. She's a client. And when we were talking and we first met, and it was just on the phone, so I'm thrilled to see your beautiful face for the first time. I said, oh my gosh, I've got to have you on the show because what you teach is so important and so empowering for women and for men too, but especially for women. I think it is because you're such a financial expert. So well, I'm you. delighted that you took the time to join us today. Well, I'm honored to be here. And truly, I'm honored for everyone listening, for choosing to listen to this. It takes so much courage to learn more about something that gives many of us anxiety or, or feelings that we don't would rather not feel. So I just really want to take a moment and honor each and every one of you that are listening because well, the more that we can really be empowered in this area, I think the more we can really raise our vibration. I agree. So let's just jump right in. Let's do you it. You say <laughs> money can be fun. What's that mean? Hmm. Well, you know, it's not the money itself, but it's the intention behind the money. So Lynn Twist, who wrote the book Soul of Money, uh, said money is a conduit of our intentions. And I just love that quote and it's really stuck with me because our intentions are always going to be fun, right? I mean, why would we have an intention that's not fun? And why would we be here? Like our whole point of being here is to deepen our relationships, to elevate our ourselves and to be able to create these beautiful artworks and, and things here on this planet. And so money is just a neutral resource that fuels all of that and allows us to do it. So... I, I can't imagine a more fun thing to think about is the things that we get to do with that resource. You mentioned earlier that a lot of people, I would say most people, even people who are trust fund babies, we all have this anxiety around money. Though if you, you either don't have enough or if you've got a lot, you're afraid you're going to lose it. And and it's crazy. Where's that come from? Is it generational? Are we taught about it? Is it just something that we come in with? I, I'd love to hear your your input on that. I love this question. I think it's a combination of all of that. I think that some of it is within our genes. I think um, if if you're familiar with the gene keys, I think a lot of that is actually inside our genes and it's meant to provide our path and our purpose. I think though also we have, you know, just from past generations, for example, my grandparents were both uh, alive during the Great Depression and their parents very much lived that and uh, like many of us. And so that then creates a different way of approaching money, you know, being, excuse me, being, uh, for example, more concerned about it going away or losing value. And so when we have that conditioning, of course, it's something that we're brought up with. And then due to the fact that as humans, our biggest thing is um, wanting to remain included as part of the community. So if our parents have taught us to be a certain way with money, even through their actions or through their words, then we can feel even subconsciously like we're doing something wrong 
by going against that thought process. So then that can create a multi-generational uh, you know, experience around money. And our money paradigm is something that we definitely develop as a child, but we do have the ability to shift that and to have a different awareness and perspective that can help us really learn a lot about it and understand that it is truly a healing process. I hear people say, and I have my whole life, well, they're filthy rich. And I think, <laughs> What's filthy about being rich? What, where's that come from? What's that mean? And, and I think about what kind of conditioning are we, what kind of nonsense are we being fed as we have somebody saying that? And, and I hear present day, I hear people say that. What, what's that all about? Is it jealousy? You know, I think that's part of it. I think also we've heard it. So it makes sense for us to just repeat it. Even I, when I first started in this, um, I misquoted and said, money is the root of all evil. And my father, who's a nuclear physicist, he, it's the only time he's ever commented on my social media. He said, I believe that the quote is the love of money is the root of all evil. And I realized, of course it is. Yeah. What was I thinking? You know, <laughs> it was just something that came out because it's just what I had thought I had heard before. And I think that because money has been used as a form of force, not power, but force, and has held it over people in terms of certain situations that we can very easily view it in a negative light. Um, but when we recognize that money is 99% behavioral and emotional, and when, when we remove that and we truly just see it for what it is, this tangible representation of a perception of value, we can start to uncover what that means. And, you know, there was a quote I heard just the other day and I loved it so much. And it was from a personal financial planner. And he said, you know, money should not be in the math department. It should be in the psychology department. And I thought, wow, that is so spot on because, you know, it's not about math. It's not about, we can all subtract two from three and know that we have one left. You know, it's, it's much more about all of these experiences that have summed up in our life to create an a, a true identity around something. And if our experience is that, you know, maybe our dad held money over our mother. So then of course we're going to view it in a negative light because our memory behind that and because our brain is so efficient about pulling past experiences for present moments, of course we're going to think that way. So it's just about having that awareness and then learning that, oh, actually there can be really beautiful things about this neutral resource. All right. That's a lot to unpack. <laughs> My, uh, your dad holding money over your mom. I hear that from women today where their husbands are doing that. And I'll ask them, well, did your, did you grow up in a family where that was the case? And they'll say, oh my gosh, you're right. I never thought about it, but I did. And so what did they do? They attracted somebody as a partner who was doing the same thing in that male versus female role, much like it's, it's well documented that people that grow up in alcoholic homes tend to be attracted to alcoholic partners. And you think, ah, how's that work? If, if it was less than optimal in the home, why in the heck would you want to repeat it? But it's almost a subconscious thing. Talk to us about that. How does that work? Gosh, well, I, I don't know the inner mechanics behind it, but I can definitely vouch that I have seen it over and over and over again. And I think it tends to be derived from that same concept of we want something that's familiar because we know what familiar is. And anything that's not familiar, that's unknown, is unsafe. And money, for example, is very much rooted in the, the chakra, the root chakra. Um, and because of that, we, sorry, I lost you. <laughs> There you oh. are. Um, and because of that, we <clears throat> tend to, I think, want to make sure we're safe over anything else. Our, our ego wants to keep us safe. So if we know that, okay, that keeps us in, well, at least we're going to survive this. So let's take that over something we don't know. 
And when we do that, we do create at least an experience where we pretty much have an idea of what the outcome is, even if it's subconscious, but it may not be the ideal one. You're reminding me, I, I just had a memory flash of, gosh, this was probably 20 years ago. I used to videotape Oprah on the old fashioned VCR yeah. tape things and then on the regular recorder and as it came in and all that. And I saw Goldie Hawn and Susan Sarandon on one day. And Goldie, who comes off as a ditz, sometimes there is nothing ditzy about that woman. She's brilliant. She is so, so, so successful and brilliant and lovely and darling and all of that. But she said, women need to always keep their own source of income and have their own account because she said, you don't want to go to your husband and go, honey, pretty please. Could I, should I, can I have a new dress for this? She goes, just go buy the dress. You don't want to have put yourself in that position ever. And that stuck with me. I had been independent and ha have had my own source of income for, for my adult life because I started working when I was 12 as a babysitter because I always wanted my own money. But boy, did that really sink into my head. And I hear it so often when I'm talking with clients who just don't have access to the family's money or they're going through a divorce or they've lost a loved one. And they are clueless about bank accounts, investments, if there is any money, if there is where it is, that kind of thing. So I thought that was just really a brilliant piece of advice that Goldie was given the, giving the women of the world that were watching that Oprah show. Do you I, run I, into that? I do. I do. Even now, I, I and I love that you're bringing this up because I, I also see a shift. I see a shift in women realizing that they do have the capacity and ability to understand this. And it's also a very common for the men that I work with um, to also feel this pressure that they're meant to know how to do this and they don't know any better than their partner. And so it creates this incredibly uh, low vibrational dynamic because there's this pressure that you know, I'm the man, I'm supposed to understand all of this. And then that can create some, you know, unfortunate identity uh, crisis and all sorts of things. But then also the woman feels like, well, okay, I don't want to make my partner feel less capable, but I also want to understand this myself. And clearly this isn't working for either one of us. And what's I've, what I've seen is a really beautiful combination of really being able to come together and recognize that they're not just from gender, but just masculine and feminine aspects of money. When you look at it as a whole, it really does create exactly what the energy is looking for. The masculine side is the container and the feminine side is all of the creativity and the intention and the, the love behind it. And so when you put that all together, all of a sudden you're on the same page. So I see with women that a lot of times I work with women first who just know that whatever they're doing is not working. And then their partner is very interested and curious about how all of a sudden there's no more anxiety around having conversations around money with their partner. And their partner's really just approaching things with a much more expansive thought process. And all of a sudden, they're getting inspired by the women that are taking action. And then it's just such a beautiful healing process. Talking about the container and the creativity, that is ancient Jewish mysticism called the Kabbalistic healing mm -hmm. that I studied for three years early on when I first started doing this woo-woo stuff. And it's about how everything has to have a container. Wow. And when I'm doing a medical healing on somebody, I always talk about the energy field membrane, which is the container that holds the energy that makes up our, our body and our spirit. And it reminds me of a really thin, of really thin stretchy saran wrap. And it, it's what holds that energy and it expands and contracts depending on how the person's feeling. And you, you hear about aura. The aura expands and contracts while well, it's all within the 
energy field membrane is what I've learned. And I wasn't taught this. It's It just came in over the years. So you're talking about a container and that creative energy. And in my head is going, ding, 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 ding. Kabbalah. That's Kabbalah 101 oh that you're gosh. doing. I, I don't know that you were even aware of that. No. It's, it's interesting, too, that you're talking about the energy of money. Can you say more about that? Why are you saying money is energy? Well, it, it is. It is. And, and it's something How do you know? that, well, I, I see it, for example, as it has all the same properties of any other energy that we think of. Water, that has energy. Air has energy. Everything is made up of energy. And so with money, when it's held and hoarded, I think of it as kind of a stagnant energy that truly wants to have a place to go. Money always wants to move. Just like if you have, like I have this battery here for my phone. If I leave this here for a couple of weeks, it's not going to have a charge anymore because the energy wants to move. And with money, the same thing can happen. We can, if we have it be, and I call it the karmic flow of money, where we are giving out and then it's just creating space for more money to come in. And so it's this beautiful cycle in a very healthy flow. But what happens is if we become, if we have fear enter in, which is very common around money, um, I've definitely experienced fear around money. I, I can see that it then gets hoarded. So it becomes stagnant because it's not going anywhere. So then it doesn't have any charge because it's just sitting there doing nothing. And I've always said, Money isn't the thing I, I care about. It's what it, you're able to do with it. So if I'm sitting in this room, I can't leave this room and I have a million dollars in cash, it's going to be worth nothing to me if I can't actually use it and spend it. And it's meant to be spent. And so with money being an energy, I view it in that way so that I can truly, I, I don't know, it's a vision I see of every time that we are using it, we're able to express our inherent perception of value through this tangible thing. Now, a lot of times not tangible because we're using credit cards or watches or whatever, but it is just really a representation of what how we value that. And so because we don't really have any tangible way to express that, in my mind, that is the definition of energy. We don't have a tangible way of seeing energy, but we recognize that it flows and it wants to flow and the properties are very aligned with any other type of energy that I've studied. I think too, that when we want to use it, when we have it available and we want to use it, oftentimes we have to jump over that, oh, really, is this worth spending all this money on? Here's a case in point. When my husband's birthday, when he turned 70 a few years back, he wanted to go to Disneyland in oh. California for his birthday because he grew up out there and they used to go to Disneyland all the time. Okay. And our son and daughter-in-law live out there. So I said, okay, we'll do that. And I hadn't been to Disneyland in a long time, but I had a friend that said, oh, you got to hire these plaid vest guys because then you don't wait in any lines and they it's great. And they you can do everything you want to do in the park and it's super easy. Well, it's a lot to hire them. And you can only have six people if you hire them. So I went ahead and hired hired this guy. His name was Sam. I believe Sam. And he uh, was with us all day. We did not wait in one line. We rode on everything we wanted to ride. If we wanted a reservation someplace, we went to the head of the line. There was no waiting. There was nothing. And my husband was a little upset with me that I had spent that money to do that. I said, look, you're just here as the birthday boy. You just need to receive. I'm planning all of this. Oh my gosh. It was the best decision I ever made. And so much so that I don't think I'll go back to Disney World if I don't have, uh, you know, if I don't have a plaid vest guy. And my son has said the same thing. He said, I'm not doing it either. So it was really terrific, but had to get over that hump and Tim will be the first one to tell you, oh my gosh, that was some of the best money ever spent. But he was really having a tough time with paying the extra price for that. And I thought, mm, that's why it's here. We get hit by a bus tomorrow. So what? Use it. Enjoy it. 
Absolutely. And you bring up so many amazing topics and points in that story. First of all, what we consider, you know, too much money or expensive, a lot of times is just because we don't have the perception or the awareness of the value behind it. And so especially if it's not a priority or we don't realize that it's a priority, we can think, well, why the heck would I spend money on that? Um, like I'm a, a big knitter. And so I have a yarn, a, an allocation for yarn. My husband has no desire to have any yarn. So he would never spend that money on yarn. <laughs> but, you know, he, he loves a whole bunch of different fitness. He has three or four different of the same weight kettlebells. Great. I would love that he loves to have those kettlebells, but it's not something I would spend my money on. So just also knowing when you're working with a partner in finances, sometimes it's just looking at what are my partner's priorities and what are my priorities. And when we, when you look at it that way, it can also be a really great conversation around, oh, that makes so much sense. This is something you really love. So of course you're going to prioritize that. But the other beautiful thing is time is so much more valuable than money. And so you just purchased something that was invaluable. I mean, being able to really spend the majority of your time enjoying the, the thing that you came to enjoy with the people you love, that you can't put a price tag on that. Well, and the whole time we were there, the whole day, Tim kept saying, I feel like I'm in a dream. <laughs> this is like a dream. This is amazing. So and cute. everybody, so many people said to him, happy birthday, happy birthday. And he, and he said, how do people know it's my birthday? I said, well, you got a big button. They gave him this big button that they put on him that said, happy birthday, Tim. I, I just want to say, duh. <laughs> everybody sees your button that you're wearing that says, happy birthday, Tim, on it. And every time we got on got on a ride or whatever, they'd say, happy birthday, Tim. It was hilarious. So that was, yeah, that was money really well spent. Back to something that you said a minute ago, you were talking about gene keys. What are gene keys? Gosh, oh my gosh. I've just recently been very interested in looking more into this. It was not meant for me earlier. I've known about it for almost 10 years, but for whatever reason, it was about a month ago, that I really started to dive deeper into this. And Richard Rudd is the person who discovered Gene Keys. And we all have particular makeup of genes that really uh, create our life's work, our purpose, how we are most healthy, um, and also just the big lesson that we're meant to learn in this lifetime. And so at first, I don't know if I was really ready to understand this, but now that I've been looking into it, it's really been fascinating because there are um, 64 gene keys and they align with the I Ching, the ancient Chinese. Um, they, they really use it more for oracle purposes, I think, back then. And he has been downloading the purpose and intention behind the, each gene key. And when we look at, there's all, it's quite complicated, but if you look at it overall, there's basically this activation sequence that allows you to see, okay, so this is how we best show up in the world with our life's work. And then this is the big thing that we need to overcome so that we can really improve ourselves as a soul and then move into really what makes us most vibrant so we can truly live our purpose. And it's all interconnected and it's also connected to human design. And I just find it incredibly fascinating. And then there's also animals that represent each gene key. And then there's three different levels of each key. So there's a fear key, a gift, and then what they, he calls the city, which is the ultimate expression, the highest vibrational expression of the key. And it also is combined with the art of contemplation. And so as you're learning about the keys and we all have them based on our, our time of birth, place of birth, similar to human design, we um, can really start to just think, how is this showing up in my life? And how can I use this to really better myself and better my relationships and truly prosper in this life? And it's just been really fascinating. So we all come in with our, our scale put together our, our key, you know, I'm thinking of, of on a piano, you're going to do your scales and practice that kind of thing, but we all come in with it. Is it something that we can adjust or manipulate in a positive way if we want, or are we just kind of stuck with it? 
That's a great question. I mean, what comes to mind for me, because I'm definitely not the expert in gene keys, but I definitely believe that there are, since there are the three levels, there's the fear level or where we're showing up in the in the shadow portion of the key, which I think many of us start with uh, in the beginning of our lives. And then as we move into really understanding it, we can see the gift behind the shadow of the key. And so I think just that in itself is a journey to be able to really understand the gifts that we currently are born with. And I personally think, like I was just having this vision this morning when I was, when I was first waking up, that I believe that with, like it finally to me makes sense why some of us are just such gifted teachers and others are so gifted at being able to really feel the emotions of others. And other people are really gifted at saying the thing that no one else feels comfortable saying. And some people are really naturally, uh, you know, are comfortable with visibility and others will never feel comfortable with that, you know, in the way that they currently are just naturally showing up, but they have another gift that is so interconnected with everything else. And so I think similar to what I was mentioning earlier with this differentiated form versus undifferentiated form as we show up, um, we also have this with the gene key. So I think this just allows us to really see what we were, what we chose to do in this lifetime. But it also, I really believe that we also can truly create whatever it is that we desire. We have free will, so we could totally go a different path if we wanted to. But I think it's something that it's really ingrained in our genetics when we feel it and we recognize it. And we it's almost like we're re-remembering what we originally came to do. And that is just like an all over tingling feeling. And it just feels so peaceful when you can truly see that from that light. I agree that we create with our thoughts and we that fear thing gives us a platform kind of like a, a diving platform you got to have a platform to stand on you may not like it but it prompts you to go create something else if we know what we don't want it helps us create what we do want yeah. in that circumstance interestingly i can scan i do this on my own home and I've done it for lots of other clients. And there is a flow of energy that's monetary that comes down the street and comes in people's front doors. Back to the old feng shui thing, you'll see a red door on somebody's house that's supposed to be attracting money and attracting prosperity, prosperity and abundance and stuff like that. And so I'm a serial entrepreneur. And throughout the years, it's an ebb and flow of money. Sometimes we got a lot of money. Sometimes the money's tight and we're starting something new. And I'm thinking, okay, where is this coming from? How are we going to get through this? But I can look, I can scan the money as it's coming into my front door. The interesting thing about this, Amber, is there are times when there's a lot of money that's come in down the street and in my front yard, but it's being restricted from coming into my front door with a really big flow. Mm -hmm. And then there are other times that it comes in. And there were even times when I would think, oh my gosh, there's so much coming in. What am I going to do with it? And I would watch this scene of the money going down into the ground and it was being sorted. And then it was on a kind of a conveyor belt that went into my bank account. It was bizarre. And then I can do that for a client. And if they're starting a new, a, a new venture, perhaps, and they'll say, okay, how, how am I doing on this? Is, am I on the right track or whatever? I can check and see what the money flow looks like. And I always check it coming into their home, not into their building. It, it never comes up into their place of employment. It's always into their home, whether that be an apartment or, a house or a, or a room in somebody else's home, it always comes in the front door. Does that make any sense to you? It does. And I've honestly never heard this before. And I'm just starting to see all these other things as you're talking about this, because one, I'm not surprised at all that you've never seen it in a place of business, because that is truly just the conduit or the machine or the vehicle 
to to deliver what we're meant to do. But the home is our soul, is our purpose, is our is our essence of who we are. And so it would make sense. Of course, it's going to come here. This is the foundation of everything that we do. And that's just the vehicle in which we're doing it with. So that to me makes perfect sense. And also when you see this, you know, I really do believe that everything happens for us. So if the money is currently not coming in, it's a beautiful indication that's saying, okay, there's there's something that, first of all, the law of opposites, which we need to create that contrast and that opportunity to come in, that money to come in. So sometimes it can be that. Or it could also be there is something so much bigger for you to, to do and that you're designed to do. And money is a direct reflection of impact. The revenue is a direct reflection of impact. So if it comes in in a, in a thing that isn't actually going to completely light you up, that can also be a reason why I don't think it's coming in because it doesn't want to give you mixed signals. So when it comes in, it's truly from both this intention and this space that's created, but also I think it's becoming just another indication that yes, this is exa- you are channeling this to where it needs to be and therefore we are letting, letting up the floodgates and it's going to come in and it's going to go exactly where it needs to go. Well, it's funny too, because sometimes when it gets restricted, I have double doors on our front door. We have double doors and the double doors will be open, but it'll be like there's a funnel or something around it that is going to restrict how much can come into the home, but it will be piling up out in my front yard and it goes both vertical and horizontal. And I can go down any street. I don't even have to be there. I can do it remotely. I can look on a Google map or just somebody just tells me I live on Apple Street in Oshkosh, Wisconsin or wherever. (laughs) And I I can see the money flow that's going in everybody's house. I don't do it in my own neighborhood because it's none of my business. And I think it's an invasion of privacy. I do it with my own house, but I don't do it with others. Uh, unless it's a client who asks me to do it. I mean, like if you called and you said, can you, I I hate this person. Can you see what kind of cash flow is coming into their house? I'd say, no, I'm sorry, I can't. The other thing is uh, on the feng shui lines, and I've had feng shui experts on the show and we've talked about this. There are money lines in the home based on feng shui principles. So there's the current cash flow line. There's the asset line. And hey, this will, you'll get a kick out of this story because it goes back to the ancestral thing. When my dad died, my mom died a few years before my dad, I brought back her good china and crystal. And we have cabinets on either side of our fireplace in our family room. So I put her crystal in one of the cabinets to the left of the fireplace. Well, it's directly on the asset line, directly on the money line in my house. Didn't even think about it. And I was scanning the money line and it looked like somebody had shot a cannonball from the out, from the inside of that cabinet out into wow. the room behind it. And I thought, all right, this is bizarre. And, the, and it was interrupting the cash flow. So I called my feng shui gal and I said, what the heck is this energy that I'm seeing? And she, she said, well, have you changed anything in that cabinet? And I said, yeah, I, I recently put my mom's crystal in there. And she said, well, how did your mom feel about money? And I said, there was never enough. Mm-hmm. She said, get it out of there. I said, what am I supposed to do with it? She said, well, wrap it up and put it in the lowest level of your home. Get it out of the main living areas of your home. And for heaven's sakes, get it off the money line. Amber, I did. I wrapped it up. I came back upstairs. I scanned it. It was back to normal that fast. Wow. So that ancestral thing, you are right on target with that. There is definitely, definitely something to that with the energy. And at that point, my mom had been gone for probably five years. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's an incredible story. And it is, I've done quite a bit of feng shui in my house and I just find it fascinating how impactful it is and truly how both the generational at things that we have in our house can affect it, plus just the properties of it itself. And, you know, before you shared the story, something else that came to mind with you talking about the energy going into the different neighborhoods and things like that. 
The other thing that just came to mind is, and I can't find a great analogy for this, but you are really good at this. So maybe you'll be able to pick up on what I'm visualizing, but money is truly meant to like, like energy, it likes to be able to move freely. And so we want that free flow. And so sometimes when it can perceive, okay, that's full right now, we need to go over here for a little bit. And it's like, it's always constantly looking for space. And it's looking to go and occupy that space, similar to what we were talking about the membrane. I view the the houses similar to those membranes. And we personally may not have all of the knowledge that we know it exists around why that energy isn't going into that membrane at that point. And then it is full, but we may not perceive it as that, but it actually is. And then it comes in when there's space. I find too, that the hoarding mentality spills over into other areas. My mother and my grandmother, both of them, when I'd open their refrigerator, it it was just like, oh my God, how do you ever find anything in here? There was no empty space at all. And some of the stuff was long expired, like, you know, salad dressing that was five years old or a jar of olives or something. And it wasn't just on the door of the fridge. It it was the shelves and everything. And both of them were born in 1925. Both of them lived through the depression and both of them were reluctant to throw out anything. And both of them struggled with there never being enough money. So I've often thought, okay, this comes over into other areas as well. One time I was in town at my parents' house and my mother's closet was just a wreck. Not because it wasn't organized because there was just too much stuff in there. And so I remember Jonathan, my son, who's now 31, he was a baby. And I said, okay, this time we're going to clean out your closet while I'm here. And she had formal gowns from 30 years ago, but she, there's no way she would ever wear them again, let alone could she fit into them at the time. But she sat in the room and I'd pull stuff out and I'd say, okay, this needs to go to the Goodwill. This needs to go wherever. Do you want this? She got really emotional. It was really hard for her to part with that stuff. And I thought, okay, this is part of this whole hoarding depression mentality thing that that I didn't have things during the depression. And so now, what, 50, 60 years later, she's still having trouble parting with things. Do you find that that's the case? Absolutely. Almost every single time. And it really is stemming from this fear that safety is going to be taken away from us. Mm -hmm. And having those things does equal safety to many people because it's this assurance that, okay, well, if something happens, I'll have that. And I've noticed that it doesn't necessarily even stem from our, uh, our experience, but I think it actually can also be from past lives where we experienced significant hardship. I myself, that is definitely something that I have been overcoming is a fear of running out of money. And that's really um, something that I first learned that I had that fear when I started my business. And I did an Akashic Records reading just to understand why is it that I have this deep fear that I'm going to be destitute. It was this destitution that I was really scared of. And I learned that many, like thousands of years ago, I was uh, this man that had leprosy in India. And I was cast out by my family and every day I was given some food by an ashram, but even they wouldn't have anything to do with me. So they made me wait until they put the food out and then I could get food each day. And what was seen in this record reading was also me at a very old age living like that. And so I live to an old age. And because of that, the lesson there was we are all divinely supported, even when it feels like you're not, you are. And that really has stuck with me to understand that this deep feeling of of fear around not having enough money, I don't think was really from my childhood. I think it was from lifetimes of experiencing hardship like that. And now fully being able to say with with 
just truth and, and not even excitement, but just assuredness that that is a fear that has dissolved, that it, it, there is a limit to fear. And once you overcome all of that fear, you can truly step into what's real or what's true. And that is that we are divinely supported. Well, that's why past lives are so helpful because once we illuminate them, it helps to eradicate the fear. One in particular comes to mind while you were talking about that. And I was working with a client, past life scans are so much fun because we just, it's like I'm walking into a movie scene and I got a year and it, what was going on and what was, it, it's like, okay, here's what's happened in that lifetime. And then we're correlating with what's going on in your current life. So this scene in particular that came to mind when you were telling that earlier is of a woman who in a past life was a uh, duchess or a, a lady or something in in the UK and she was living in this manor house out in the countries, but it was up on a cliff. She was at the seaside. It might've been their summer home or their seaside home or something. It was a mansion, it was massive. And there were these cliffs and her husband died and she didn't have any children. So all of the estate with the whole primogeniture thing was going to her husband's cousin or somebody that she didn't know. And she had nowhere to go. She had no money. She had lived this opulent lifestyle. But when her husband died, nobody cared about her. Nobody in the family, there there wasn't anything they could do just the way that it's set up. So she jumped off the cliff oh. and died by suicide. And this had come about in this lifetime for this woman because she was going through a divorce she didn't know where the money was. She didn't know how she was going to survive. She hadn't worked a job since she was in college because she married into a wealthy family and her she felt her husband was hiding money and stuff. And she felt like she just was almost thinking, oh my gosh, should I just end it? And once we illuminated that and it was from the 1700s, it made sense to her. And she said, well... I don't need to do that again. I've already played that part. And I said, you're right. And now she has a business of her own and she's thriving. But that's how helpful the past lives are, can be, especially when it comes to illnesses and relationships and money and things like that. Yeah, I it, it looked like a scene out of Downton Abbey. That's what, <laughs> that's I, was what, it reminded me that's what I was saying yeah. when you were sharing. I said, oh yeah, I mean, yeah. that makes so much sense. And and, you know, it's just so fascinating how just that piece of information that you can get in less than half an hour can completely change the trajectory of your life and recognize, oh, yeah, I don't need to do that again. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm meant, to, I'm meant to do something else in this life. And I love that. And I love also how it's almost like it's for us. It's for us to have that fear because then it can remind us we've already done that. And that way we can still stay on path for the thing that we're, we're learning and doing and expanding in this lifetime. Yeah, it's like a semblance of the script is carried forward, same basic script, different variables, different date, different time, different set of circumstances, but same basic script yeah. going on there. And then we change the script. We rewrite the script when that happens. Do you believe that we all come in with financial wisdom? It's just innate yes. or is it learned? I think it's innate. We have been so deeply conditioned both as society and the financial industry itself to be otherwise, that we are going through a re-remembering, not just of who we are truly as, as souls, but also just all of this other wisdom that we have. And, I, and so, yes, I do think it's innate. Um, and what I find is that a lot of times it's simply the perspective that we need to shift. We all have the information within us. And I, when I teach about this and I talk about, for example, when I first started my, my business, I was given guidance on a generic revenue goal of $5,000 a month when I lived in DC at the time. And I was also given guidance in the, the health certification I was going through that I had a certain pricing that I was meant to start with. And I just did some simple math. I do have a background in finance, so I had that uh, as well. But 
I thought, okay, so they want me to have 60 clients a month and at the same time be $3,000 under what I need to survive. That is not a great way to start a business. <laughs> and we can all say that. We can all say that. Everyone listening to this knows that if we're making $3,000 less than we need and we're going to work 60 hours a week, that that's not a sustainable thing. And it's definitely not something we would choose to do. So I think it's more about the perspective of just knowing that the information that we're currently seeing may not be in at the angle that makes intuitive sense to us in terms of the decision we want to be making. And I think that every decision we make is a beautiful one. And it's those decisions that shift. It's because we have new information. And when we have new information or a new perspective, we make new decisions. And we all have access to universal intelligence just by asking. Yes. Because our heads are big satellite dishes and they receive and transmit frequencies. And when we ask questions, that tunes us to that frequency and we can get guidance. For my classes, the price of my classes has all come from spirit. I'll say, what do I need? Where do I need to price these? And then I'll argue with them. My my uh, spirit guy, my main spirit guy, Pope Clement the Sixth, for the angelic attendant training, he gave me the price, and it stayed the same for all these years. Twentieth class is this fall, and he gave me the price. I said, ah, I'm not doing that. Nobody's got to pay that. That's the price. He just he just stayed on it, stayed on it, stayed on it, stayed on it. So when I sent out the first email. Okay, here we announced it. We did it. I had all these people sign up from four different countries and pay that price. So I said, okay, I surrender. I surrender. But people have asked me, how'd you come up with that price? I said, well, it was divinely guided. It came from my spirit guide. And that information I have learned is there for us. We, most of us who are entrepreneurs or have done something in, in the lines of creating our own income streams other than just a regular job. I think we've had that guidance, but maybe we weren't cognizant that it was guidance coming in. We just had a thought. We thought, oh, okay, I'll do that. Well, now I know that is divine guidance that's coming in when those thoughts enter our heads, especially when they're specific. Yeah, I love that. And I love that that's how you do price your things and also for everyone listening, I really do believe that we are all good with money. And I think that's where it comes from. I mean, we all are able to receive that information. And I think it's more that we've been told we aren't or that we, you know, we don't have the capacity to do that, or this is too complicated. And that is truly, I see the financial industry as a separate energy, a collective energy. And there's a lot of ego and fear within that and a lot of control and a lot of force. And when we look at it as just, no, that's not how it needs to be. It's actually super overcomplicated. And I think that even financial professionals don't know what they don't know around what we really are meant to know when it comes to money and what it truly is. And I think that we are about to go into a complete uncoupling or decomplication of money and we're going to come back to what the true essence of it and allow it to be free flowing and know that when we treat others the way that we want to be treated, it truly will create this beautiful settling. And I think when our nervous system is settled around this, we can truly expand into creativity and we can experience the life that we came here to live and not be so entangled with this complication that's not necessary when it comes to money. I want to touch on that here in a minute, but I got a couple of other things I want to cover first leading up to that. How did you get to the place where you realized, okay, there needs to be more education about finances and, and all of that? Because there's a, there's a big piece missing from the whole financial conversation. What, what was that journey for you? Well, when I was in the financial industry, I worked in both nonprofit and for-profit government entity, government agency, contractors, all of that. And I just learned very quickly that it was like I was mentioning before, just full of ego and complexity. And being in college, I also saw that as a significant thing. And I remember being in a college class, it was an investments class, and there were people talking about how 
you know, this is how we can increase our profitability. And so I asked the question, what is the point of increasing profitability? Like if you're already profitable and you're paying yourself a great salary, what is the point of, I just want to know, I was curious. And I could tell he did not have an answer for me. And he just paused for a moment and he said, he kind of jokingly said, well, isn't it good just to have more profit? I mean, every, who wants less profit? Everyone wants more profit. And he just kind of shoved it off and did not answer the question. And that's when I realized that already there was this significant disconnect because if we don't have intention, which is the feminine aspect of money, then it's not going to stay in the container that we create for it, especially not anything that's good. So I, I saw that early on and then I went through my career and then I left my career thinking I would never touch money again with a 10 foot pole. You know, I had PTSD from the Xerox machines. I moved to Bali, Indonesia. Uh, I had become a holistic health coach. And while I was there, I was getting guidance, like I had mentioned before, that would just didn't align with what I knew made sense. And then I started talking with other incredible entrepreneurs and realized over time that as I was speaking to them individually, that they all felt isolated. They all felt alone in the thought that I'm the only one who doesn't get this, but as an entrepreneur, I'm, quote, supposed to get it. And so then I saw that there was just this significant gap in understanding what really matters. And so when I saw that, I was like, okay, we aren't teaching this properly. And at the same time, the information that we are looking at does not align with what the true essence of money is, which is just a vehicle for what we want to do. And so that's when I started to see maybe I'm truly meant to combine what I learned in health coaching certification and my financial background and recognizing that there's this beautiful combination of marrying the masculine and feminine together, of recognizing that money is 99% behavioral and emotional, and that when we can remove that, we can truly, with a settled nervous system, see what we weren't able to see before and make decisions that align with our vision. And I think that that is going to raise all of us up together when more and more people are empowered in that area. Okay. I got to unpack some of this. What really matters when it comes to money? It's almost like an, not even something that I think about. So I think it really matters that we recognize that it, there's a presence there, but it's not a focus. That it's allowing us to truly live our life with high vibration. Uh, someone asked me earlier this week, what, I, I want to know what your money routines are. I'd never been asked that question. And I realized I don't really have a money routine because it's not something I think about very often. I have a lot of automation. I know the bigger picture of what it's meant to be doing and where I want it to be intentioned and all of that. But because I have that in place, my focus is on relationships. My focus is on touching the hearts of others. My focus is on just really enjoying the beauty and the nature that surrounds us and feeling that that true abundance when we're outside. And when I notice the birds and when I feel the air on my skin, that's what I believe we're really here to do. And money just allows us to have that experience because it's giving me the ability to have this water that's, you know, coherent and filtered with a Berkey and has electrolytes in it. And that we have this m mechanism of you being in Alabama and me being in New Mexico and being able to communicate, all of that was purchased with the resource that we call money. But that's not the focus. The focus is the actual living life and, and communicating and getting to be connected. I agree. You talked about a settled nervous system. Say more about that and how money and enjoying money, I'm assuming, can help us settle our nervous system. What does all that mean? Well, I've noticed over time that when someone is given information and a different perspective about money, all of a sudden, this light bulb goes off. Oh, there's nothing wrong with me. This isn't me. There isn't something that I'm doing wrong. 
I think many of us carry this, this secret or internal shame and guilt around money about that we're not responsible with it or we're not using it properly or we're being frivolous with it or we're not making enough of it and we tie our worth with money. And so saying all of that and looking at that, it's, it's like, no, 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 no. Remove all of that and recognize that money is, again, just that vehicle. It's allowing you to do the things, but it's not, it doesn't, doesn't uh, define you. It's not connected to your worth. We're all infinitely valuable. It's, it's really about just allowing ourselves to feel settled in the fact that it will come when it's meant to come and that we have exactly what we need and that the 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 brain and r- really just everything about us we cannot think creatively when we're in a state of fear and so if we have so much fear subconscious or not around money it really suppresses our ability to be the creative beings that we're here to be well said back to the banks and financial institutions what is it that they don't want us to know, number one? And number two, we hear all this stuff about the great reset and we're going to digital currency and the dollar's not going to be worth anything. And if you have a bunch of money in the bank, that it's it's not going to be worth anything and la, 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 makes my head spin. Can you just kind of walk us through that and help us make sense of how what your perspective on all of that is. So first of all, what is it that financial institutions and banks don't want us to know? Oh my gosh, can we extend this conversation? Sure. <laughs> so much I Absolutely. have about this. Okay, so the the thing that they don't want us to know is pretty much everything. Um, for example, I was 24 when I purchased my first condo. This was in... 2005. I was just about to turn 25. And I was given an opportunity. I was making, I think, $40,000 a year at a nonprofit. And they wanted to give me $350,000 worth of purchasing power. Now, that would have required me to not put any money towards my retirement and to do a lot more deductions to even have enough money take home to make the payment and still have a few hundred dollars left over for everything else. Now, they were encouraging me to do this. And then on top of that, they were encouraging Who's me. Who's they? Uh, Was that the, your bank? The, the mortgage broker. Okay. And they were also wanting me to um, get a adjustable rate mortgage. So not only was I going to have a really high payment, but then in five years, it could balloon up to something that I wouldn't have been, a- been able to pay. Now, I didn't realize it at the time, but I remember thinking to myself, just I was very fortunate to have a financial background because I had just graduated with a degree in finance, that this did not make sense to me. And that they wanted me to do an interest only loan on top of that. And so I did my own numbers and I said, look, the absolute maximum I will do is 180,000, which in DC meant we were looking at efficiency apartments and uh, it, turned out that I was able to find a one bedroom with den for 179,000 and it was great. <laughs> I lived in it for a long time. But I share that because I recently rewatched the documentary The Big Short and sadly many many Americans were presented with this and didn't have the knowledge that it was not a great idea. If we had been explained it in that way, by the way, you're going to have most of your money go towards your house. And then in five years, it could balloon up past what you even can pay and you might lose your house. Ready? Do you want to do it? No one's going to say yes to that. But the financial industry, of course, doesn't show it like that. Look at what you can purchase. You're so great. They use psychological words to ensure that we feel like the hero in the story and that we're doing such a great job taking on this great opportunity. And it just really fuels me to get the message out there because it is so unfortunate that this information is not being shown in the way that it's really meant to and that the best interest is not with the client. So that's just one example. But there's so many things that I see. For example, um, I travel to Mexico quite a bit. I love going to the beach there. 
And when we're given the opportunity to pay in either Mexican pesos or in U.S. dollars, they always want me to do U.S. dollars. And as long as I'm using a card that doesn't have the international fee, which many don't, like AAA doesn't do this, they don't charge the international fee, and a lot of ones that really promote travel don't either, but other cards will charge 3%, so be careful with your credit card which one you're going to use. But when I choose to use Mexican pesos, I always write down the number they want to charge me in U.S. dollars, and then the bank is going to use the rate, the exchange rate that is what they're legally required to use instead of what the hotels can use that are, it's going to be different. And there's always a significant difference in the amount that I'm charged for in my favor if I charge in Mexican pesos. So it's, it's that kind of information where we're not given the, the big picture. And so they're taking advantage of the fact that we don't understand this so that they can make more money off of us. And it's frustrating. You're talking about high interest rates. I bought my first house in my 20s in Los Angeles, which is some, like DC, some of the most expensive real estate. And I it was before I was married. And I started out at 12% interest with a five point balloon on it, up to 17%. And so I laugh now when I hear people say, oh my God, I had to pay 6% interest. I said, oh, please. People, I knew people that were paying 17, 18% interest. And it was just nuts. The other thing that I find that people really are intimidated by, and it just fries my rear end when I hear about it, are the medical bills. People, so many people go bankrupt because of the darn medical bills. And sometimes they even have insurance and they still, it still bankrupts them because the copays or the whatever are so expensive that there's no way that they can ever pay it off in their lifetime. And a lot of the time it's somebody who's elderly and it takes all of their savings to pay off the medical bills. Do you have any suggestions for people on how to work in that niche of the financial industry? Because it is a niche, the insurance companies and the whole medical industry is a niche of the financial industry as far as I look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, in terms of tips, I would say just educate yourself as much as possible. Research, look, ask people, and also just ask, like you were saying, when we ask for information, we will download it as well. So pay attention to those intuitive nudges that you're also experiencing and 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 truly feel when you're approached with a certain opportunity if it doesn't feel right, it's usually not right. And you don't need to even understand why it's not right. But I, I, I think that sometimes we can tend to ignore some of those just intuitive feelings as well. Um, but when it comes to medical bills and all of that, I think one of the best things to do, and this is something that I've done with, with my clients sometimes when they're looking to provide insurance for their staff or they're looking to get a new insurance. Um, I used to be a controller for a nonprofit. And because it's a nonprofit, we wore a thousand different hats. And one of them was helping all of the people understand what health insurance to get. And what I would say is understand what your insurance covers and understand um, the, the choices that you have in that as well. Because I think part of the problem with having health insurance is that with Parkinson's law, everything expands to that space. So if we have insurance that's willing to pay X amount of dollars, the medical companies or billing departments are going to always charge way higher than that so they can get their maximum. So if you don't have insurance, always say, you know, I am paying out of pocket. I need to know what you can do for me because they are always going to charge you way more than any insurance would allow you to be charged. And so sometimes they will have those rates. I have found having a, I have a, I'm an entrepreneur as well. So I don't have, um, you know, a company to get group insurance on. So instead I use this group insurance that is, um, it's kind of like a co-op insurance. And while it doesn't cover all the day-to-day little things, I look at the bigger picture, which is I want to minimize my overall out-of-pocket cost if something catastrophic happened to me. And so for, for, for that reason, I looked more at 
you know, what would happen if I had this big thing happen? How much would I actually have to pay? And then that way I can have that money saved. And so then I have assurance that, you know, if something does happen, this is going to be the maximum amount that theoretically I'm going to need to pay. And then I still go about my life. But with insurance, I think it's just so all over the map. And I think it's a, it's a significant thing that will not continue. There's, there's so many broken parts of that industry. Um, but I would definitely say just from the billing standpoint, just check to see and ensure, even if you know it's not being covered by your insurance, that's one of the biggest things I benefit from having that co-op insurance is that even though I know my insurance isn't going to pay because I have a super high deductible, by having it run through my insurance, I know I'm not going to pay the high bill amount that they're doing just to make sure that they get that coverage. Well, a couple of other things to ask for an itemized bill, because you may get a bill from the hospital that just says pharmacy or it just says physical therapy. You want an itemized bill that you can do. And then the other thing is ask them what they take if you pay cash. If I pay today in cash, it's usually less than half of what that bill is. And and they will work with you. Case in point, I had a baseline, I think it was a contrast MRI or CT scan. This is 10 years ago or so. And the doctor, you know, put up a thing, had me go next door to the office building, to the hospital. They were going to do it. I'm, I'm in the registration thing. I said, what's the fee for this? And they said $10,000 and they wanted $2,000 up front. And I said, I, I don't think so. This is a baseline thing. So I said, yeah, let me hold on this. Well, I'll, I'll get back to you. And I get up and I walked out. Well, I called a single standing, not connected with a hospital radiology place. The same test, Amber, was $700. <laughs> And I had no out of pocket copay from 10,000 to 700. Point being, call around when your doctor says, okay, we need to send you for 15 million tests and stuff. And it's just easy for them to send you to the hospital to do it. And that's part of the business model. I'm not saying that they're doing anything underhanded, they're not. But take a minute or two to call around and see, all right, where else can I have this done? And then the next time I saw that doctor, I told him what had happened and he got so mad. He said, our system is so broken. It's so ridiculous. And he said, my patients don't know to do that. I said, well, I was in the medical industry for 30 years on the supply side, but I wasn't on the insurance side. So we do have options. We can call around. Even if you're going to have a procedure like a surgery or something like that, call different hospitals in your area and ask what the price is. It's going to change. Don't don't just rely on where your doctor is sending you and they'll call and see if your insurance covers it. While well, most of the hospitals will deal with your insurance company in one way or another, but just call and ask what the prices are. That's such good advice. And also it's making me remember that also ask who all is going to be involved in charging me because it's so amazing how many different people can be involved in that bill and that you can have four different bills. I, I recently, you know, I'm 43 and I started to have mammograms. Well, I find out that 3D mammograms way better than a regular mammogram. Well, that's a whole extra charge. And then on top of that, there's so many different charges related to that, that I had four different bills. It was over $1,200 just to get this mammogram and our, my normal annual exam. And it was, it was amazing to me how many people were involved in that. And I think that's really shifted in the last 10 to 15 years. I don't think that was as common, you know, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. You probably had a radiology bill and you had something else and something else. And when somebody has surgery, you'll get a separate bill from anesthesiology. You're going to get a separate bill from the hospital care. You're going to get a separate bill from the surgeon, all that stuff. And a lot of doctors, and I understand why they do this because they can't carry the receivables for long periods of time. But a lot of the time you have to pay up front and and sometimes you have to pay the full amount up front before they'll do the surgery. You got to pay your copay up front. 
yeah. because they they are it takes so long for the insurance companies to pay them pay the doctor's offices and that's a game the insurance companies play and they're they're using the float on the money and they're coming up with 15 different ways oh well no this isn't and you and they have to rebill it four and five times and then for for long it's a six month waiting time for them to get paid by the insurance companies so it's a whole quagmire that uh, I don't know what the answer is. I just know that there are hacks that can help us navigate it I as idea. we go through it. Yeah. I, I have an idea that I think would work really well, and it comes from ancient Chinese medicine. And that is for many, many centuries, we paid to be healthy. So as long as we were vibrant and healthy, we were paying our physician. And when we were sick, we did not pay and there was mutual interest in getting us better because the doctor wasn't getting paid and we didn't want to be sick. <laughs> but now it's reversed. And so now right. it's really more, let's keep our, you know, income stream alive, but not thriving. And I think that's really the bigger problem here. And I don't believe that most doctors even are aware or they're becoming more aware that that's actually the bigger problem and that they haven't even been given the true information, I think, to keep us thriving. And so it, it does require, I think, a lot of just empowering ourselves with what re really makes us thrive. And that's where I believe the gene keys really are helpful because we all have different things that really keep us thriving. Um, you know, my friend, her gene key is all about the food she eats. For me, it's the community that I surround myself with. So if I'm isolated or live alone in a far off land, I'm not going to be very healthy no matter what I do because I need to be around people. So, um, but I, I do think that it's significantly broken. And I di recently did some research and in Taiwan, they're noted as one of the most efficient medical systems in the world. And there's this YouTube video that I came across and this person was living in Taiwan, had her physician father come over from the States. He had a problem with a frozen shoulder and he went in and within less than, I think an hour and 45 minutes, every, he had gotten through everything and then it was only $70. And he was blown away because he knew the details of what would normally happen in that situation being in the States, even as someone with connections to other doctors and he just was blown away that it could all happen in one building in such a condensed amount of time and not cost, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. So I think there's definitely hope. And, and I do believe that we will move in that direction when we can reduce the amount or, or really dissolve the fear. That's really, truly what's, I think, causing a lot of this to begin with. Well, and why is it that we as Americans are paying these exorbitant costs? It's because we can because that's what they're charging. I had a client a couple of weeks ago who had C. diff and she was on her third antibiotic and it was $9,800 for 10 pills. Wow. I thought, what? And she, I said, what did it cost you out of pocket? And she said a couple hundred. And I said, $9,800? And she said, yeah. I said, so it'll be worth, it'll be a $30 charge when it's a generic. But that's, that's nuts. That's just craziness. Back to the energy of money. I want to go to credit versus cash. The whole Dave Ramsey model, you know, do plastic surgery on your credit cards. He's a guy that says you, you go, I took his class in probably 1995 before he was a big deal. I was living in Nashville and I took his class and he talks about, do you want to, pay for as much as you can in cash. If you don't have the money, don't buy it. And certainly your mortgage or cars like that, he even says pay off your mortgage and pay off your cars and don't don't finance them. Have you noticed that there's a different energy between credit, credit cards, mortgages, car payments, stuff like that, and cash? And how do they intersect? Is one more advantageous than another? Does it make sense to use credit from an energetic standpoint? How does all that work? Oh, I love this question. Well, first of all, I think that the Dave Ramsey approach can be really beneficial for certain people. And I also think that for many people, especially very creative people or people that just feel that there must be 
another way of doing it that there is. And I, I definitely think it can be helpful to have that mentality, but I also think that it's not really the problem. The credit card isn't the problem. It's our perception of what we're spending that has changed. So if you think about it, a hundred years ago, if I wanted, like, I absolutely love your earrings and your jewelry that you're wearing right now. And if I wanted, let's say that you were, oh, you know what? I don't really want this anymore. I'm happy to sell it to you. How much do you want, want to pay me? And I decide, okay, I come up with a number and I have the cash and I hand you the cash. Then you can hand me the jewelry. You receive cash in your hand, tangible cash, and I receive the jewelry. And that is an even exchange. That's really what money is for, is to have that 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 exchange of energy or that exchange of value. What we have done over time is first it was with checks, but then we have these credit cards and we, you know, hand it over. So now let's say that we're in 2023. I'm handing you this credit card. You swipe it. You hand me the jewelry, but then you also hand me back my card. Now, by you handing me back both the jewelry and the card, I've not really in my mind, in my brain, subconsciously given you anything because you've given it back to me. And then on top of that, what I, and, and they've noticed and we've done research since we have instilled this method of payment, consumer debt has skyrocketed. And now what I believe is going to happen is now we have these magic wands, you know, and I'm holding up my wrist with my Apple watch. There's Apple pay on there. So now if you were able to accept Apple Pay and I ask you for the jewelry, you hand me the jewelry after I just swipe my hand across your device. I don't even ever part with anything for a moment. I'm just waving a magic wand and then I'm receiving the jewelry. So I don't feel the same energetic exchange that I felt when I handed you the cash. And so that I believe is really what's at the root of it is that I, I notice even with myself, if I pay for a meal and it's $40 or $38.28, let's say, and I swipe my card, it feels different than if I hand over the last two 20s in my wallet. There's just something different about it. Because when we have 20s in our wallet or 50s or 100s, whatever it is, it feels like, ooh, <laughs> all this money. But if we only have the credit card and it's representing the exact same thing, but it looks different, 3819, that doesn't necessarily in my mind equate to the two $20 bills that I would need to give out. And so I think that's really the root of what has created this, this consumer debt situation. But also, I think it's also important to look that I don't actually think these are bad. I think that they can be really beautiful vehicles for when we don't have the cash, the cash is still sitting in the street and we're waiting for it to come into on our front door. That sometimes, and, and Kate Northrup actually talks about this, that debt, she renamed it, you know, blessings already received. And I love that because it's just being able to have gratitude for that experience when you did need to use it. I had a friend um, and client who had gone a year with her husband out of work and she was a school psychologist. And she had to use her Amex for that year to put food on the table to make sure her kids still had a normal life and could go on the field trips and all of that. And she called her Amex the naughty Amex. I said, you know, I just want to encourage you to look at this from a different perspective. Just imagine if you didn't have that Amex that year. What would have happened? You know, I mean, your kids have no memory of any of this other than you guys had great dinners together, they went on their field trips, you still had normalcy in their life and they didn't go without. And when she saw it from that perspective, she said, oh my gosh, like this is the most beautiful gift. And we can look at it from that perspective. So I think it's both a combination of the shame that we carry around something that I think can really be a beautiful thing in our lives but also the fact that we just have really lost touch with the value of what we're paying for and that the vendors in the financial industry honestly have also taken advantage of that. Like you were saying, like $9,800 for 10 pills because they know the consumer is not going to make the majority of that payment and they can get it from the, 
you know, elusive, uh, what do you call it, insurance company. And it's, this is all coming from somewhere. And we really are due for a massive reset. And I think that is going to happen sooner rather than later. What do you think is going to happen with that reset? I think that if we truly allow ourselves to surrender to what's happening and knowing that it's all happening for us, we will get through it with much more ease. Uh, but there's going to be a, a, a big, big disruption. I think there's going to, this is not a sustainable way of living. Um, I felt that from very early on as a child. And I do believe that we are going to have this significant thing that's going to, I don't want to put a, I, I, I really say this with anticipation because I know in the end it's creating space for something much more sustainable and much more peaceful. And we're going to feel much more settled and we're actually going to feel more prosperous after all of this than we do now. This is creating a huge vacuum of fear and creating this, oh, we must have more, we must have more. But in actuality, after this big reset, and I think it will be a crash of certain things that we're then going to kind of emerge from the rubble, recognizing what truly is, is that we all are divinely supported and that by giving to others, we're also giving to ourselves and it's going to be a whole nother level of humanity. Um, I have so much more to say, but it's just, I can see this, like, it's almost like everything's kind of crashing down, but we can also see that it's actually happening for us. And then we're truly going to live what prosperity really is. And wealth is just one portion of it, but it's also health, it's relationships, it's peace, it's fulfillment. And most most of that is not occurring, I think, right now with this huge, tense energy around money. Yeah, the credit card debt at 25% interest. Or, or Things are never going to pay off. Yeah. Is it 30, some yeah, of some them? Some of them are 30. It's, it's yeah. really crazy. Crazy. Couple last questions. Can you share three easy steps that anybody listening can take to help them start healing their relationship with money? Absolutely. So the very first thing, I think it's really important to just give yourself a lot of grace and allow yourself to just feel into how you're feeling right now without any judgment and just becoming more aware of the current state of your relationship with money. Um, that sets the stage for your ability to shift in your perspective. Uh, the second thing is I think it's so important for us to really determine what it is that we really want to have in our life. Um, I think that it's important for us to look at what we're currently spending and see, are there areas that aren't really bringing me joy, but I'm paying it because of some other reason? Maybe I think I should have this. And should is always a great word to kind of see, are you using that vocabulary when looking at it? And looking at your expenses, and maybe that that means just getting out a piece of paper and pulling out your, your bank statements and just looking through and seeing where the money is going and asking yourself, similar to Marie Kondo's organizational thing, does that bring me joy? And if it's not bringing you joy, then you may want to ask yourself if that's still really necessary or is that something you can remove? And it's not about reducing expenses per se. It's more about being really intentional with where your money is going because money wants to go to places that does give that vi high vibrational state to yourself. So if you show that you are intentionally funneling money into the things that really bring you joy, that allow you to be joyous to other people, then more of it flows to you just naturally. So that's the second thing. So the first thing is giving yourself grace. The second thing is looking at your expenses and see if there's anything that you're not really enjoying that you're spending money on. And then the third thing is to look at the items that maybe aren't a monthly bill that you know you spend money on. For example, many of us, um, you know, celebrate the holidays in December. And so that is always an added expense for a lot of families. And that's what's called a true expense. So when you have a true expense, it's really something that you don't have monthly as a set amount like a mortgage. Um, but you know you're going to spend money on it, like birthdays or house maintenance or car repairs or spontaneous generosity. There's all sorts of different things. And so if you list those out and then you just give an estimate, how much do I either want to spend or that I do spend on these areas per year? And then sum that up 
and divide it by 12 and think of that as an additional monthly bill. And that will help you really be able to see truly what your expenses are so that if your income is not uh, more than the expenses that you've listed, then you know that there's, there's either a need to realign your expenses or find additional income to come in so that those can be aligned and you can feel really good about your plan for your future plan for how you're spending. And I don't call a budget a budget. I call it an expansive spending plan where it really gives you permission to spend money in the areas that bring you joy. For example, having money set aside for vet bills, you know, and then when your dog is not feeling well, you just have no concern about going because you know you've put aside money for that or being able to get a massage, or being able to treat your girlfriend to lunch, all of those things, when we are clear that that's where we want this money to go, we then are given opportunities to do that. And it's a lot of fun. Wonderful. Last question. Why do you think we incarnate? Oh, (laughs) I love this. I think it's to continue to better ourselves and to evolve our soul. And I think it also, we just know it's fun. I, I think that it's a, such a vibrant world that we're in as we're incarnated. And I think every time that we go back, uh, it's really beautiful and it feels great. But then we're like, oh, I want to go back. This is so much fun. I want to feel that wind in my hair again. And I want to be able to smell fresh bread coming out of the oven. I want to be able to hug and embrace my best friend. So I think we just have this like deep desire to have these sensational feelings that we don't typically have when we're not in human form other than sound, so. I agree. How can people learn more about you and your work? Well, um, we have a great website called amberdugger.com. Um, my, my program is called Profit for Keeps, and so you can look at profitforkeeps.com. We do master classes regularly to teach more about all of this, and I'm on Instagram at profit.with.amber. Perfect. Thank you for enlightening us on the the connection between energy and money and how money is energy and how we can use it to live a life of joy. And everybody that's listening, I hope you have some golden nuggets. I certainly picked up several of them. And so we're sending you lots of love from Sweet Home, Alabama mwah, and from New Mexico, where Amber is too. See you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Julie on Instagram and YouTube at Ask Julie Ryan. And like her on Facebook at Ask Julie Ryan. To schedule an appointment or submit a question, please visit AskJulieRyan.com. This show is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be medical, psychological, financial, or legal advice. Please contact a licensed professional. The Ask Julie Ryan Show, Julie Ryan and all parties involved in producing, recording, and distributing it assume no responsibility for listeners' actions based on any information heard on this or any Ask Julie Ryan shows or podcasts.